Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message today is Humanity on Trial, and I'll be preaching from Romans chapter 3, if you'll turn with me there. I hope you're enjoying the series from the book of Romans. It's such a rich book. And no doubt, Paul's letter to the Romans was, is quite profound in its day. It was, and it is today as well. And Paul's writing, as he wrote to the Romans, was written in such a way that Western minds understand it quite clearly. You know, there's different ways of thinking in the world. Not everybody thinks like Westerners, which I would consider most Americans as Western-type uh, thinkers, people who reason deductively. And Paul meets us right where we are in our way of thinking in the Western world. And in uh, the book to the Romans, Rome was considered the West at that time. And Paul does not hold back uh, writing the truth, which gets preached every Sunday around the world ever since Paul wrote these letters. Today we pick up in Romans chapter 3, and we find a trial in this letter, <clears throat> in this chapter of Romans. Paul is like a lawyer. He anticipates the opposition that he'd get against God, and he presents his case against human humanity. And since this is a letter, it's not like Paul is having a debate. I know Joshua's in debate at uh, Trevecca, and if you've ever had educational debate, you have to, depending on the rules of the debate, you might have to argue both sides of a case. It's very difficult to argue both sides of a case, especially when you're really determined that one side is right. But in educational debate, that's what you're trained to do. Well, Paul right here is arguing both sides of a case. And like anyone um, truly prepared to defend the truth, he knew what the opposing side would say. He knew the questions that went along with the truth. And some people, you know, I'm sure you know people, you might be one of them, you don't like having difficult conversations, difficult theological, biblical conversations because maybe you don't want your faith to be shaken. Well, we shouldn't be like that. We should be strong enough in our faith that we're not shaken by some, uh, some new teaching or some philosophy that's come down the pike to catch us off guard. In this scripture, Paul takes on the very difficult topic on whether man is condemned by his own sin or not. The first part of this trial scene is Paul's defense. He anticipates the opposing points by sta stating them and by not shying away from the answers. The second part of the trial scene is Paul as prosecutor. He states the case against humanity. No one is righteous. So we have two sides of the trial here. From now on, when you read Romans chapter 3, I hope you'll think of it in terms of a trial with both Paul as the defense and as the prosecuting lawyer. There are two points in the message today, and here they are. First, Paul defends God's righteousness. And second, Paul pleads guilty for man's unrighteousness. So first we have Paul defends God's righteousness. Paul tackled three questions head on. Uh, he didn't wait for them to come. He expected them, and they fall in three categories. He talks about the Jews' spiritual advantage, God's faithfulness, and God's justice. Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. What advantage then? Is there in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? For in every, much in every way, first of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true, and every man a liar, as it is written so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Verse 5. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. 
Certainly not. If it were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, as in some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is deserved. The first question here that Paul brings up is deals with man's view of his spiritual advantage. If only Jesus can save you by changing your heart, then what is the spiritual advantage of being a Jew? This was a question that Paul was anticipating, and Paul answers that there was a huge advantage, much in every way, because the Jews had been entrusted with the very words of God. In the Greek here, in which this uh, letter was written, uh, there's a word, the word here is called logia, that's the word, the Greek word, some translations translated as oracles, and it's used to describe the direct words from God to Moses given on Mount Sinai when he received the law. They were entrusted, the Jews, with the very words of God. So Paul said, yes, there is an advantage. This was a huge responsibility to be entrusted with God's word, and many took it as a huge responsibility. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and other scriptures tell us about how the Jews taught their children seriously uh, about God's word and they, how they put scriptures around the doorpost, around their, uh, uh, around their homes, uh, on their bodies. And having the law, God showed people how to have a right relationship with him. Also in having the law, God provided light for guidance so that people would know how to live. And also having the law ultimately showed people their need for faith in God and their need of God's grace. And later on we see in verse 20 that through the law we became conscious of our sin. So the law, the advantage that the Jews had was that they knew, they should have known from their study of the law that they were sinners, that they needed faith in God, and that they needed the forgiveness of God. You know, we as exposed as we are to the Word of God could ask the same questions as the Jews. What advantage is there in the gifts as God has given us right now? If all we have to do is, is repent and believe. Well, as Paul states much in every way. If you've been entrusted with the very words of God, you have an advantage. It does not make you spiritually superior. That advantage should draw you closer to God quicker than other people who've never heard. And if you, if you have this word of God, consider yourself blessed of God. But listen, many of us have grown up in the Bible Belt with easy access to God's word, with... Uh, preaching on numerous radio channels and TV and different forms of media with lots of printed material, of, you know, of which there's no prohibition against any of it. And in the middle of all this advantage, there are many who are unfaithful, just as people, the, the Jews of the Old Testament at times were unfaithful. Being entrusted with the very words of God is a huge gift but it comes with a huge responsibility and many fail to put their trust in God, Jesus, the very word of God made flesh, even after hearing the very words of God. For a moment, I want you to think about the Israelites. God led them out of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea for them to walk on dry ground and he provided manna from heaven and quail for them to eat. And after all of this, after God proving himself faithful for them for so long, they made for themselves a golden calf. And they worshiped the golden calf as an idol because they were tired of waiting on Moses to bring down the Ten Commandments, the law of God, the very words of God from the mountain. So 
man is prone to be unfaithful to God. This brings us to the second question. And Paul, in this question, Paul dealt with man's view of God's faithfulness. Verse 3, what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? And this is like one of the most common reasons I've heard for people who make the choice to not follow Jesus. They'll say it's the hypocrisy of people in the church. You know, we've all heard it. Why would I want to be a Christian with all the hypocrites? If there are so many people in the church that are hypocrites, then I certainly want to have company with them. You know, that's really just an excuse. And Paul was not afraid to answer this objection. He said in verse 4 about uh, replying to his question about God's faithfulness and people's unfaithfulness. He said, not at all let God be true and every human being a liar. As it is written, he goes back to Psalm 51 here, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. Even if every human entrusted with the words of God or not is a liar, God is still true. Even if every human is unfaithful, God will still be faithful. If people around you are not trustworthy and are unfaithful, you can rely on God because he will always be trustworthy and faithful. In the Jews' unbelief, many of them, not all, but many of them perished without faith. And today, even with all our spiritual advantages around us, people are dying apart from knowing Christ. Does that mean that God is unfaithful? No, he's still faithful. Is God still just when he is allowing people to perish? Yes, he is. And God, Paul goes back to the, an earlier scripture to answer the question. He quotes Psalm 51. This was David's confession of his hidden sin, his adultery with Bathsheba, a married woman. And in this psalm, he talks about how his sin is always before him. He talks about how he has sinned only against God. Here we have Paul's answer to the question of, of does man's unfaithfulness make God unfaithful? And the answer is no. We are responsible for our own sin. God does not make anyone sin. And because we are responsible for our own sin, we are accountable to God for our sin. We know in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, which we'll study in a few weeks, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, can you say it with me? Christ died for us. In his defense of God, Paul comes to his last human argument. Here, Paul deals with man's view of God's justice. Should we sin to bring God even more glory? Wouldn't God's judgment of our sin make him unjust? In verse 5, we read, But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? In other words, Paul was saying, If God's forgiveness through Jesus, if Jesus paid the price for our sin, then the more we sin, the more valuable Jesus' price that was paid. So let's just sin. And in this day and throughout history, there, has been te there have been teachers who teach this. We're forgiven. So let's just do whatever we want. And the more we sin, the greater God's grace. So Paul is posing this argument. And he said, no, this is not right. Another way to say it is this. If my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I condemned as a sinner? Verse 7. And let us do evil that good may result. The condemnation is just, verse 8. This is, as Paul says, a human argument. It's a tempting one too. What a dangerous way to think. Don't we like to justify our sin? Don't we like to justify it? This past week I saw in the news where a man committed a heinous crime against another person. And in court, the man said that 
the victim wanted it. You know, in his mind, his actions that resulted in the death of another person were justified. But Paul answers in verse 6 about all of these thoughts about sinning more so that God's grace could, could even, even be displayed more. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? For God to judge the world, he must be just. Or for God to be just, he must judge the world. Sinful humanity tries to twist this around. But God is just. His word stands forever. I'm telling you, there are a lot of people who do not like Romans chapter 3. Do you know why? Because Romans chapter 3 makes us squirm a little bit. It's, easier, it's easy to avoid conversations that make us uncomfortable. You ever go to a family reunion and avoid that certain person because they're always going to bring up something that's uncomfortable? You hope that it's a large enough of a family reunion so you can go over here and talk to the other people. In your jobs, those of you who are still working, or at school, those of you who are in school, do you find yourself avoiding people that make uh, things difficult for you? Well, I believe a lot of us like to avoid Romans chapter 3 because it makes us uncomfortable. But God's word stands forever and God is just and he is righteous and we are not just and we are not righteous. So when we're standing side by side with God, there's no comparison whatsoever. Sin ultimately brings death. And while his word brings life, we can be assured that our sin will bring about death. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, as the scripture says. But Jesus came so that we could live life to its full. John 10, verse 10. So we have in this trial Paul's defense of the opposition which is upholding God's righteousness. And second, the second part of this trial, Paul pleads guilty for humanity's unrighteousness. In this so well written, cleverly done, spirit led would be the better way to say it, letter to the Romans. Paul does not put any single person on trial, but he puts humanity as a whole on trial. Look with me in verse 9. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jesus and Gentiles alike are under sin. As it is written... There is no one righteous, not even one. There is not one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away, they have become together worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Verse 13. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before them in their own eyes. Now that, verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. And when he's talking about the law, he's talking about the law of Moses, the law given by God to Moses, which was incredibly strict, that no one could obey 100% because no one was perfect. So the purpose of the law was to point out man's sin and need of man to be faithful to God and the need of man to be forgiven by God. In this case, where Paul outlines his charges against humanity, the second half of the trial, he says, no one is righteous. Next, he says, no one understands. And this is not about people not having enough knowledge. This is not about people 
uh, being able to not understand spiritual things. It's really about refusal to understand. Next, he says, no one seeks God. And this is about our will because we tend to follow our will. With, without Christ changing our hearts, we will not seek the will of God. This is the bondage of the will that Martin Luther called it. Without grace, we don't even desire to follow God. We have a void. We walk around with a void feeling that it needs to be filled with something more and we fill it with all kinds of things. It can be just about anything, you name it as an effort, a futile effort to fill that void, even empty religion. But all of those false void fillers lead to emptiness. Next, Paul says that all have turned away. They have together become worthless. As David said, we are sinning from the beginning, but God created us for good from the beginning, apart from Christ. All are living a life against what we were created for. And then Paul also says, no one does good. All those who don't understand or seek God, who are turning away, we are, all of us are prone to do that. All of us are truly incapable of doing good out on our own without the leadership of God. You know, all, think of this, all goodness comes from God. All good efforts come from God. The non-believer who does good things, do you know why? Because God is leading them to do good things. The person who claims to be an atheist, the person who defiantly opposes uh, any type of faith in their own lives and abhors it when other people share their faith with others when that person or people do good things it's because of the grace of God leading them to do good things because none of us will do good things on our own so Paul said no one is righteous no one understands no one seeks God's will everyone has turned away and has become worthless and no one does good and in this case against humanity, Paul shifts to the physical evidence. This is just so incredible about how Paul proposed his argument here from a philosophical point of view. And then he gets to the physical elements. There are six anatomical parts of the body as evidence of the guilty verdict that, he's, that we're about to have. Throats, open graves, tongues that practice deceit, lips that have the poison of vipers on them, mouths full of cursing and bitterness, feet swift to shed blood, and eyes with no fear of God. By the time Paul was done with this, I'm sure every reader across the original uh, recipients of the letter and everyone who's heard it ever since, all of us can see ourselves in this part of it, can't we? Earlier in the chapter, Paul quoted David who said he had sinned against God alone. And we also see now, too, how sin affects others in its path as well. I've heard this, and it's so true. I've said it a couple of times in my sermons. You never sin alone. It always includes someone else or it affects someone else. So we see how unrighteous man has no way to stand up against a righteous God. He, we, have no defense. There is no argument that can exempt us. But you know what the scripture tells us? Paul says it right here. We are all guilty. None of us are righteous on our own. None of us. And so we stand before God as guilty. That's the declaration. Standing before the judge standing before the law of Moses, standing before humanity, standing before the scripture, we see one declaration, guilty. Now we're conscious of our sin. And when we admit our guilt, we are totally 
desperate. You know, st silently we stand before God because we really don't have any defense. And this is where we must, in front of him, repent of our sin and believe that Jesus will save us. Believe that Jesus died on that cross in place of us and believe that he was buried and that he arose again and he ascended into heaven. If you continually try to defend your faith and say the right things, if your faith is not the faith of the Bible and it's your own faith trying to say the right things, perhaps it's time to be quiet. Perhaps it's time for you to quit trying over and over to memorize yet more facts about the Bible thinking that that is going to earn you some type of extra points in heaven outside of a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We are depraved without God. The scripture says no one is righteous, no one understands, no one seeks God. Whew. Isn't that depressing? But there is hope. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And the road to hope for you today begins with simple repentance and letting go of your pride, your justification of your sin, self-righteous acts, self-righteous works, self-righteous thoughts. Let go of it because all that does is make the hell train go faster for you. Repent and believe. And as we continue this study in Romans, we will study more about God's hope for us because he has hope for every single one of us. He has a wonderful journey for you in this life. In this life, not just the life after. He has come that we might have abundant life, live this life to its full. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of your scripture right here in Romans chapter 3. We do confess that we are guilty before you today. We confess to you today that we are sinners we understand, Lord, in a, in a total acceptance way of understanding that our sin penalizes us completely and that the only hope that we have is through Jesus Christ. Thank you for that hope. If there's anybody here today who needs to uh, repent, I pray that the person is doing that right now. If there's anyone here today who needs to Share the truth that Jesus has become their Savior and let others know. We know that you've not called any secret disciples, but that you want us to all be public and let others know that Jesus has indeed saved us. In Jesus' name, amen.